thank you first to uh, our panelists for joining us today for uh, this uh, webinar we're going to run on online hate and harassment, what professors uh, need to know. I think uh, the shift online in higher ed in recent weeks has um, brought about um, a lot of turbulence for a lot of people uh, in higher education as a whole, but I think it's also brought to light an issue that isn't necessarily new in higher ed, but it's taking on uh, new dimensions. Um, and of course, we're talking about the spread of online hate, online extremism, online abuse, and online harassment. I'm joined today um, uh, by uh, three experts on this issue, um, uh, Victoria Vilk from PEN America, Cynthia Miller Idris, professor at American University, and Oren Siegel from uh, the Center on Extremism at the Anti-Defamation League. Thank you all for uh, joining me today. And of course, um, I'm John Friedman, and I'm the director of the Campus Free Speech Program at PEN America, which is sponsoring today's session. Um, the way that we're going to run today's webinar is essentially we're going to have three brief presentations from each of the panelists, and then we're going to open it up for questions from the audience. Um, we have uh, limited um, some of the capabilities on Zoom for some of the audience, but we hope that you'll all be able to participate uh, by putting questions in the Q&A uh, box at the bottom of your screens. And if you have any other uh, comments or uh, uh, ideas or thoughts in response to what we're talking about, uh, please feel free to put those in the uh, chat box. Um, I'm going to allow each of our uh, panelists to just quickly uh, uh, introduce themselves. I think we've said, I think each of you, why don't you take uh, about five to seven minutes uh, uh, to tell us a little bit about your work, your expertise, uh, your lens uh, that you bring to uh, these topics, and then uh, we'll go from there and move into questions. So first up, we have uh, Victoria. Uh, second, uh, Oren, and then third, Cynthia. So, Victoria, I'll hand it to you. Sounds good. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and John for getting us all together. Let me do a quick screen share um, to, to make sure you folks can see. All right. So far, so good. Nope. Nope. There it is. <laughs> okay. Um, I just have a, a few quick slides that I'm going to show you folks. Um, here you go. John, can you let me know if, I think it's still loading, but is that good? Can everybody see? Yep, we, we can see it now. Excellent. All right, everyone. So, hi, uh, my name is Victoria Vilk. I um, am the Program Director for Digital Safety and Free Expression at PEN America. Big part of my job is to empower writers, journalists, uh, newsrooms, and publishers with strategies and resources to defend against online abuse, which is really increasingly being used as a censorship tactic in a pretty coordinated uh, and focused way by all kinds of groups online. Um, I think it's really important that we, you know, one of the things we've been trying to do at Penn is just to make sure that we start to develop a shared set of words, definitions for how we describe what online abuse is and, uh, you know, how it's playing out. And so, you know, we have defined online abuse, there's a lot of different terms for it, right? Cyber harassment, cyber abuse, but we define it as the repeated or severe targeting of an individual or group in an online setting through harmful behavior. And if it sounds, you know, quite broad, it is that way intentionally, it's really an umbrella term that's meant to encompass a range of ever evolving tactics. And we're seeing in this moment just how quickly those tactics evolve. I'm gonna very quickly run you through some of the key tactics that we're seeing play out um, in, the, in the journalism world, in the writing world, but also in academia, uh, so that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. So, you know, hate speech is fairly self-explanatory. It's really sort of focused on a person's identity, targeting someone because of their identity. Um, threats of uh, physical violence for women and non-binary folks, it's often also threats of sexual violence. Uh, dogpiling, which are coordinated attacks by so many hundreds or in some cases thousands of attackers, whether they're bots or real people or a mix of both, um, that it's really meant to overwhelm the target on the receiving end. Uh, doxing is the publishing of sensitive personal information um, online, like your home address, your social security number, where your kids go to school really intended to intimidate. Um, impersonation, this happens a lot to journalists. Uh, it's essentially, it can happen on social media, it can happen in email, but it's when somebody takes your image and your name pretends to be you, and then uses that platform to um, spread defamatory or dangerous or problematic information under your name or in your guise. 
Message bombing is flooding a target's phone or email account with so many messages that they basically can't use it. Uh, Non-consensual intimate imagery is, um, you know, manufactured in some cases, um, photos of uh, someone, sexually explicit images of someone um, spread without their consent. And who knew that this was a thing we all had to be worried about until the last few weeks? Zoom bombing, which is crashing a virtual meeting with the intention to disrupt, harass, or spread hate. Uh, I should say, I mean, I think we'll, this will come out as we do the Q&A quite a bit, but it's really important to think about where some of this abuse is happening, right? Is it happening in kind of virtual classrooms, virtual settings like that? Is it happening on social media? Is it happening on people's, you know, emails, um, email accounts, and uh, cell phone messaging um, platforms? So those are some things for us to keep in mind. I do think it's important to have a little bit of um, context in terms of numbers. This is a study that Pew did in 2017, so it's three years old. This is the, the most comprehensive, most recent study we currently have. I guarantee you these numbers would be higher now. But back in 2017, over 40% of Americans had experienced online harassment themselves. Over 60% had witnessed it targeting others. And I think unsurprisingly to many of us um, women, uh, people of color and members of the LGBTQ community are disproportionately targeted um, and, and by more egregious forms of abuse. Uh, the last sort of point I'll make is that Penn, um, one of the reasons we got involved in this issue is that we are a membership organization. We have over 7,500 members who are professional writers, journalists, editors, publishers, academics, all across the country. And we actually started hearing from them around 2015, actually 2016, about the degree to which online abuse was getting in the way of their ability to speak freely, um, to express themselves and to make a living. We did a survey and we were deeply alarmed uh, by the degree to which folks who had experienced online abuse had not only feared for their safety and the safety of their families, but actually engaged in all kinds of self-censoring behavior. So they changed how they wrote about certain subjects, they stopped writing about certain subjects, they either permanently or temporarily left social media. And so, you know, a lot of how we've come to look at this issue is it's, it's squarely intersects with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, right? What spaces are, um, open enough to allow folks, you know, from all different backgrounds to express themselves. And, and in what ways is online abuse being used deliberately as a tactic to censor voices, some of which have already been historically marginalized. Um, so we actually spent a year uh, building this digital toolkit. We talked to technologists, uh, psychologists, lawyers, a lot of folks with direct firsthand experience of abuse. And um, this toolkit is really intended to be a comprehensive resource for what to do, how to prepare yourself proactively in advance against abuse, how to respond when it's happening to you, how to offer support and take care of your mental health. Um, I don't have time, obviously, in five minutes to get into depth about any of these things, but in the Q&A and as we're all having a conversation, I'm happy to talk in very practical, concrete terms about what steps you can take to protect yourself and how you deal with and navigate abuse when it comes up, as well as any other things um, that crop up. And with that, I'll just sort of say that, you know, we've been following this issue closely for several years. And uh, what is kind of amazing about this moment um, with the pandemic is I didn't think it was possible for our lives to go digital even more than they had been, but it is, you know, between learning, um, between, you know, all of us are on our phones on social media platforms all day long right now, tracking what's happening in the news. And in a way it's created this real kind of, I think as um, Cindy said, like a perfect storm uh, where people are home. In some cases they're unemployed, they're stressed out, they feel isolated. Uh, and so we are seeing abuse actually um, really go up, particularly for certain groups. Um, Asians, Asian Americans, and also for science journalists, public health experts, folks who are writing about the pandemic. So it's a very kind of salient issue in this moment, and I'm so glad that um, John has brought us together to talk about it. So I will hand over um, to the next uh, speaker, but that's it from me, and I'm just going to stop sharing the screen. Thank you, Victoria. So we're going to turn next to uh, Oren Siegel from uh, ADL. And uh, I'll just remind those watching, you know, we're going to be taking up a lot of questions. So please feel free to uh, submit them in the Q&A. And we're going to uh, turn to them uh, as time uh, affords. Uh, Oren, uh, if I'll let, I'll let you take it up next. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Um, appreciate being asked to, you know, speak in this sort of informal, formal discussion. 
Um, and also just want to, you know, take a moment to thank everybody for joining the meeting. I think we're all still very much getting used to uh, what is the uh, new reality as best as possible. Um, and, you know, I just hope everybody on this call and your families are, are staying healthy and safe. So uh, one of the reasons I'm, I'm excited to be on this call is, you know, hate and harassment, whether it's targeting professors or other, um, you know, other communities, is just something that I've just spent, you know, 20 years looking at. It's, it's frankly, these days, kind of a distraction from uh, even worse things that are out there every day. And, you know, what we have seen at ADL and the Center on Extremism is sort of the development of not only online harassment, but online harassment targeting very specific communities. So what I'm bringing hopefully to this conversation is very much through the extremist lens. You know, I know that there's all sorts of other uh, forms of harassment and hate that manifests itself against so many different communities every day. But our sort of niche in the Center on Extremism is looking at the campaigns and the tactics that extremists um, are using. And I will say that in general, um, prior to this pandemic, prior to um, much of what we've seen, the focus from, say, extremists, but in particular, right-wing extremists and white supremacists on college campuses has been about winning hearts and minds, right? You know, one of the ways that we've tried to measure this, because it's not always so easy, is what is the level of propaganda, right? White supremacist materials that have appeared on college campuses. And what are they saying? And is that some sort of, you know, indication of the motivation, of the plans, and the way that extremists, in this case, white supremacists, view the landscape on campus? And here's some, you know, very basic information that shows, you know, over a three-year period, there was a massive increase in white supremacist propaganda, not only outside in general, but on college campuses specifically. And why are white supremacists targeting college campuses? You know, they view uh, liberalism, PC culture, feminism, uh, a whole range of other issues, diversity and multiculturalism as anathema to their fundamental worldview. And the way that they feel like they can bring their messages of hate, their narratives, um, and maybe, maybe find the next generation of those who might subscribe to this idea is by targeting college campuses with their ideas, toning down their language a little bit, oh, and by the way, creating fear and anxiety for many at the same time. It sort of hits both of those points. And so we've seen this sort of doubling down. And frankly, we've seen a younger generation of extremists. And I want to just say up front, I'm not necessarily talking about an individual associated with group X or group B. Most extremists are completely unaffiliated with any group. This is true with those who carry out mass shootings, and this is true for those who engage in online spaces, who create memes and irony and humor to try to promote their hateful ideas, right? Most people are independent actors. And frankly, what I find interesting is that a time where, and here's just some examples that you'll see on the screen of some of the messages, right, that we're seeing. But here we are in a moment in time, I know classes are canceled around the country, people are moving toward more, you know, virtual learning, this is true for, you know, third graders, and it's true for college kids. And beyond that, we are spending more of our time, I'm learning this, and I thought I spent a lot of time online to sort of echo what Victoria was saying. I'm spending even more time online, and more and more of our day-to-day -day activities of finding community, of finding meaning, of being able to reach out to friends and family is happening in an online space. And extremists never miss an opportunity to exploit that. And so what we've seen with Zoom bombing, that I think eighth category that Victoria showed on her list, and here's just sort of a basic description, um, is again, this practice of using the very tool that I am speaking to you all on now, in order to create division, in order to disrupt, and in order also to spread hate uh, and harassment. And so what we've seen is in many cases, very, um, you know, uh, a, a wide range of different types of meetings, whether it is a classroom that wants to get together, whether it's a religious institution, whether it's a community event, putting out information saying, come join our meeting but they are not aware that their security settings are not great, right? The defaults allow anybody to communicate. 
We even had a conversation to lead up to this meeting to make sure that we were you know, as secure as possible. And so what happens is, in some cases, students don't wanna to go to class, they share this information about these Zoom links, hoping that people will disrupt it so they won't have to have class or to you know, create fear and anxiety. Extremists are piling on as well. And what we've seen at ADL, getting nearly 80 something reports in the past couple of weeks of Zoom bombing that are sort of hate motivated, is that these are being shared as a way, again, to create division and further hostility. You know, we are all hopefully socially isolating, trying to be responsible and finding ways to communicate online. Extremists are also spending time in isolation and trying to figure out ways to exploit this. And so they will continue to try to push their narratives of uh, against diversity, multiculturalism, uh, et cetera. The standard tropes that they believe in, they are going to try to continue to bring that to these online environments in which professors are going to try to teach their classes in which students will try to find community at a time where perhaps they feel isolated. This is what extremists do. And I'll just give you one example and why I think it's beyond random, why I believe we're gonna see a systematic increase in this. There's an individual, a known neo-Nazi hacktivist named Andrew Arnheimer. He's been known for posting, uh, excuse me, hacking into printers at colleges and universities around the country and putting out his white supremacist propaganda. Well, we were able to identify him as taking part in and disrupting two Zoom events, Jewish organizational events, in the past couple of weeks. In one, he literally shared his screen and showed his Nazi tattoo on his chest. In another, he made anti-Semitic comments. When you have somebody as notorious as him, who's involved in Zoom bombing, in disruptions, you can be sure that a more coordinated effort is soon to come behind that. And indeed, we are tracking coordinated efforts on various social media platforms, even up to today. So I'm gonna leave it there and just say, we've seen online hate and harassment for many years. This didn't start with a pandemic. We've seen college campuses be the focus of extremists who want to expand their message and create fear and anxiety. Today, as these lessons are going online even more, um, we need to know that the extremists will adapt and therefore we too have to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Oren. Um, I think the point is well taken that um, certainly this moment has been one where um, as a society, we're all kind of turning inward to, you know, how does this affect me and, and what's going on um, in my life and my own safety and my own health and, in, um, and that of my family. And, and of course we have our societal concerns too, but it's interesting to hear about thinking, you know, how do we think about it and how do we track the activities of uh, groups that are organizing who are also kind of taking advantage of this moment or who are also kind of home in isolation and have um, different opportunities afforded to them um, uh, by, the, uh, by the moment. I'm gonna turn now to our third speaker, Cynthia Miller Idris. Uh, who will uh, talk a little bit about her research and her insights as a faculty member from AU. Great, thank you, John. And uh, I just also wanna echo what Orrin said. Thank you all for coming. Um, you know, one of the advantages in this strange moment in time is that we can often, uh, through these kinds of venues um, and, and, and mediums, con you know, be in touch with a lot bigger audience than we might be able to get in person. And so, you know, I can see that there are over 150 people listening. It's um, terrific to have you all here, and I hope that you are all staying safe, and, um, and thank you for joining us. Um, I just have very few slides to share. Um, I'm going to pull these up. Uh, so my name is Cynthia Miller Idris. I am a professor of education and sociology at American University, where I direct a lab on polarization and extremism research um, called the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is, is testing uh, a variety of interventions designed to try to interrupt um, radicalization to extremism at early stages. So sort of pre-prevention and also creating off-ramps for um, uh, youth who are already on a pathway toward radicalization. My own experience for the past 20 years also has been in um, uh, in the radicalization and white supremacist extremism world, but looking at school-based responses to hate and how schools and universities and colleges are responding and what they might be able to do um, a little bit differently. So I'm trying to see. 
So what I want to talk about is, um, uh, you know, I want to echo what, what uh, both Victoria and Oren have already said, and I think that um, I, it doesn't really need to be repeated again, but I'll just say that we're seeing a pivot from, you know, the, the, the massively increasing radicalization that had already been happening um, in clear ways through, through physical acts of paper flyers and um, controversial speaker series, provocative speaker tours um, are now pivoting online. Um, and just just in the last um, really couple of weeks, and I think not only is it the case that um, I fully agree with Oren that that colleges are being targeted because they are seen as kind of um, you know the the liberal bastions that can be attacked or need to be attacked, but also because um, the modern white supremacist extremism movement is seeding intellectual leadership for its own future growth, and I think we're seeing a shift in. Um, in far-right extremist movements away from um, only the kind of um, Aryan Brotherhood prison gang or um, backwoods militia that people are familiar with toward a more modern form, which is um, uh, uh, you know, recruiting also intellectual leadership and trying to cultivate that intellectual leadership for itself. So you're seeing kind of the creation of academies in Europe, summer academies for seeding kind of far-right thought. Um, and the attempt to build within um, and recruit young people who will then later be in positions of leadership. I think the, the really important thing to be aware of right now as, as college faculty, as teachers, as parents, as community members and caregivers is this massive shift in um, online engagement, not just for us, but for uh, as teachers and faculty, but, but for um, children and youth is unprecedented, obviously. We have now 55 million plus, that's, that number's a week old, it's probably even higher now, um, K to 12 students who have moved home into online learning context. There are over 15 million, approximately 15 million college students who are now largely le either learning online or you know, in, in uh, online context now shifting to online. And so the, the numbers are hard to comprehend how fast that happened. And not only that the learning has shifted online, but the um, the, there is a much less supervised kind of engagement and dialogue, much more heavy amount of online gaming going on, community engagement, um, participation in online fora, um, everyone's social worlds, as we all know, have just 100% shifted online and, uh, or, or largely, unless you're living in a community or have other people right around you. And so the risk of exposure is much, much higher than it was. And, and this is a very um, it is a, a, a sort of perfect storm is the phrase that I was using in our conversation yesterday, as Victoria mentioned, because of this kind of unstructured or semi-structured, um, and, and in some cases for, for young people who are in the K-12 system too, very unsupervised for totally good reasons. I'm very sympathetic to parents who are allowing their children more online gaming or who, who don't have the time, obviously, to go in and supervise what's happening when they're in these online fora. But, um, but it is just something that has created a kind of perfect storm when even, you know, school districts are providing devices and creating hotspots. And so you have young people across the spectrum who are now online in much greater um, amounts. So for those of us who do research on this area, for the younger grades, it's a problem. And we have the same kinds of problems happening um, among young people who are also at a moment when they feel incredibly, you know, anxious, depressed, disillusioned, have themselves faced unemployment or have family members now unemployed in large numbers, um, economically insecure, uncertain about the future. And those are the kind of um, emotional vulnerabilities that create, that, that lend themselves to be drivers toward online radicalization or radicalization in general um, and, and more vulnerabilities to recruitment. And I'll say educators, of course, as we all know, because of the part of that perfect storm is that educators were largely unprepared unless educators happen to already be working in an online context. So there are, you know, there are these key group of, of teachers, both in the K-12 um, online uh, systems and in the online degree systems who already have the expertise to do this. But the rest of us, um, it's a completely reactive, not proactive kind of situation um, through no fault. And so, and so we're scrambling to catch up. And there is a sense that you know, we're seeing what the things are and then catching up and getting guidance. So what can we do? Just a couple of things and, and not that I have time to do this now, but we are, there are many different resource guides out there, including some great ones from ADL um, uh, on, you know, the symbols, uh, the kinds of euphemism and phrasing, what might come up in a chat room in a context if someone's talking about 
um, you know, uh, European heritage in that context, in what context, how is it being used when, you know, if the OK symbol is being used, again, where context always matters, how are those symbols being used in, an, in a, and shared as emoji? How are they being shared? Um, being aware of what some of those signs and symbols are can help people recognize them when they come up in conversations and chat rooms um, and, and be able to interpret them in context to understand how they're being used and if they're being used in an innocent way or in a way that conveys um, extremist content. Obviously, we all know that there's need to be familiar with the platform settings and be aware of the available restrictions, um, not allowing people to use nicknames and being clear about um, how, to have, how to have those settings. And we can talk about that in q and I think most people have uh, caught up to that now, but if you haven't, um, there are several guides out there and most universities, I think, are scrambling to produce um, guidelines for faculty on how to set the restrictions in Zoom, for example, or in any other platform so that um, people do not have the ability to share screens or to share audiovisual content, um, that there are restrictions on who can on, on who can join, that you can um, not share your personal meeting ID number, which is used again so that someone can repeatedly attack you, um, but that you use a unique uh, URL link each time you hold a meeting that would be publicly available, for example. There, there are a number of guidelines like that that can help prevent um, some of these uh, uh, Zoom mobbing attacks from happening. Within classrooms, um, you know, really important to continually revisit ground rules around engagement and to revisit those ones that hopefully were set up in the physical classroom at the beginning of the semester about how we communicate with each other and, and revisiting those so that when someone breaches a rule um, with, uh, with uh, you know, a phrase that they're using or, or insults someone or is using something um, that that goes against the community guidelines that can be shut down right away. So, so managing that in a new way in the online context. Um, and I won't get into a lot of this, but I think this is, gets to what, what Victoria was saying. Um, it, online, the exposure creates more vulnerabilities for all of us um, in faculty and uh, you know, leadership roles or re, you know, public facing roles. And so basic cybersecurity and information security um, uh, there are regular webinars, PEN America did one recently just on things like, you know, how to, um, you know, make sure that you're doing uh, basic cybersecurity kinds of, um, uh, you know, two-factor authentication, all kinds of things that would keep your own information safe, your own email safe. And I think that's, I just want to mention, I think it's really important for doctoral students who are doing research in this area too. Um, if you have doctoral students who you're supervising who are out there trying to study the, the extremist movements online and their movement online, trying to make sure that there are safety and security guidelines that are set up for them as well. And finally, and this varies tremendously, and so this is, um, there's no easy answer to this. I th I'm hopeful that we will over time start to see more synthesis across campuses on these points. But ideally, every campus has some sort of protocol, has a point person, um, a place to send and forward threatening emails, screenshots of direct messages. We have one at American University that is an investigator who answers this email and uh, to whom can be forwarded snail mail if you're still getting that um, or any other kinds of messages you receive. But, you know, I worked at the university for years before I knew that we had that. Um, I think that that for if there are any leaders out campus leaders on this on this Call, making sure that campus leaders are aware of how they communicate that information. First of all, that they have such a person or people within their campus security or IT staff who support faculty and students in that way, who can investigate the source of threats um, and the nature of the threats, but also that, that people are aware where, that, um, where those emails can be sent to, and so, or voicemails or whatever they are. And I think um, just being aware of those basic protocols and having, um, if you are receiving threats in a, uh, that you're in a, situation where you can have that conversation with public safety. And I will say, I think we have some really fantastic examples. My own campus is a fantastic example, I think, of, of response to this, but there are others I've heard from others that are um, have not been responsive. So I think there's great variation in that and room for improvement. Um, but it's worth trying to figure out what the uh, protocols are that exist and whether things can be done on your own campuses to improve the, the support for faculty and students in those areas. Um, so I will stop there and just say, you know, uh, obviously happy to take any kinds of questions on the, the hands-on, um, you know, faculty experience or what faculty can be doing. So thank you. Okay, thanks to all of you.
Um, we're going to be taking up some questions from the Q&A and mixed with some questions I had as well planned for the session. Um, so uh, please, uh, to the audience, please continue to submit them in the Q&A. We are tracking them and we'll be taking them up in turn. Um, I wanted to just ask a conceptual question first, actually, for each of you, um, um, which is, you know, how when thinking about like how we define this or, or how we, um, you know, think about or name, you know, online hate or online harassment or abuse, um, it seems like there's a great deal of ambiguity. I often get questions about, you know, well, when is it really hate speech? Or, um, uh, Victoria, you were mentioning uh, dogpiling a minute ago, and like, what is the difference between, I don't know, what we might call um, community, concerned community uh, uh, interaction on social media versus, you know, dogpiling and, and uh, harassment. Um, so I was just wondering how each of you thinks about you know, ways in which we can, can define this. Cynthia, I think you were mentioning the, some of the ambiguity yourself a minute ago around the okay symbol and thinking about context. So just conceptually, you know, how do we think about and name hate and, and do it in ways that can be consistent and, and um, um, you know, ways that still, that kind of empower people to speak out against it um, uh, without getting lost in the kind of shuffling, uh, 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 you know, wiggling out of blame that a lot of people have done once they've engaged in something hurtful to somebody else. And I guess I'm going to go look to you, Victor Victoria, first around the dogpiling issue, or when is it really harassment? <laughs> well, one of the reasons that anytime I do any kind of presentation on online abuse, I start with a definition and a bunch of tactics, and I explain what the tactics are, is because I think that uh, it is really, really important that we talk about, like, that we have shared language and shared definitions for what is actually happening to people. That doesn't mean that uh, the terms are not... Um, can't be, there are not cold, hard, you know, lines between this is hate and harassment and this is something else. You know, sometimes it's very, very clear, like doxing is a fairly straightforward thing, right? It's like someone takes private information that should not be circulated, publishes it with the intention to intimidate you or terrify your family, right? That's fairly straightforward. Hate speech, I think in some ways, you know, there are operational definitions of hate speech, certainly in Europe, legally. I think we obviously in the United States approach that problem quite differently. Um, but I think developing a language for the tactics that people are using and giving examples of what those tactics look like is really important. And so on the field manual, actually the, the most visited section of the entire field manual resource that we have is the definitions page, which tells you like, this is what the tactic is. Here are a bunch of different examples of how it looks like um, so that people can actually, one of the first things I tell people when they're dealing with abuse is name the thing that's happening to you. You know, make sure that you understand if you feel like it's abuse, you know, what shape is it taking? What does it look like? What platforms is it happening on? And that way, when you go to talk to an employer or to law enforcement or to somebody else, you have a language to start from to describe what's happening um, that I think gives some force and some credence to what you're, what's causing you concern or disrupting your ability to express yourself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to answer this in a, a little bit sort of a, a different way. Um, I'm going to share right now the, the most popular part of ADL's website is our hate symbols database. I think Cynthia mentioned this, right? And this is why it's important is because, you know, you can scroll down here, there's images, et cetera. I'll stop sharing because we don't need to get into all the details. But the reason it's the most popular is not because it's telling you all these symbols and numbers are hate. It's because it's telling you the context is key. And this is true also with when we get reports from individuals who felt that they were harassed online. I mean, there's a reason people are reaching out. Um, and listen, I'm never sort of judging, oh, is it really harassment? Like that's not our goal is to sort of question somebody, but it's to collect that information as much as possible. And also to provide um, some guidance and explanation in the way that people are using terms. So sometimes as Victoria said, it's very obvious what it's about. Other times it may be less so. So the okay symbol, which I think was mentioned as well, this is a perfect example. People go to our hate symbols database, not to necessarily say, ah, see the okay symbol is a hate symbol, but usually to find evidence that it was not used in a hateful way. And I think as those of us who are looking at hate and harassment, it's really, really important that we reserve, you know, calling something hate and harassment to those incidents where it really rises to that level. And so tools, whether it's the tools that Victoria was talking about, whether it's our hate symbols database, you know, where that context is able to be sussed out is really critical. 
We need that shared language, but we need to have that shared understanding that context is indeed key. Yeah, I would just add, um, uh, agree with everything that Victoria and Orrin have said, and, and also would say that, um, you know, one of the things I've found from all the years of working with young people in and around far right scenes and school based responses to their efforts or their engagements is that um, shutting down young people typically leads only to more creative responses. So a complete shutdown. So when schools outside of um, Berlin, where I was doing research, banned the number 88, which we saw briefly on the screen, which um, has been used for you know decades and decades um, to, to refer to the eighth letter of the alphabet for HH for Heil Hitler. When schools banned the display of the number 88, kids started wearing t-shirts that said 100 minus 12 or 87 plus one, right? And so the game playing nature of it can, um, can very quickly evolve and rapidly develop into something that is fun for young people to just continue to provoke, right? So again, this is, we'll throw up restrictions on Zoom, but pretty quickly they will come, you know, they'll, they'll find some kind of workaround or some way to hack into it. Um, and so I think we do have to take precautions, but we also have to really look at the roots of it and try to engage, you know, engage as much as you can when you see it, rather than just shut it down and exclude, um, you know, with some exceptions. But the engagement and, and trying to understand why did someone think that was funny to share, if, especially if it's a young person in your class, do they understand the meaning of it? Do they understand what was the intent behind it? And take a chance to have some pedagogical kind of engagement with young people in those in small group settings, at least around these symbols and their usage, so that they understand that their intent doesn't always equal the impact um, that 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 symbol can have. Something like the OK symbol, where they think they're being provocative or um, um, trying to to get a rise out of adults, um, can very quickly evolve into something. Um, you know, much worse. And so I think those are the kinds of things that I that I caution about when we're thinking about bans or shutting down, uh, shutting down kind of um, certain kinds of speakers, let's say, or, you know, um, is, is that very quickly tends to lead to uh, more creative evolution. Yeah, I know, Cynthia, you and I have talked a lot about this in the past, the ways in which um, uh, definitions of hate speech often, you know, are, are, can be, can backfire basically when they are, um, uh, you know, when you give too much power to uh, authorities to determine what's hate, you know, how one president, for example, might have defined uh, hate speech is, we can all imagine, would be entirely different under a different one um, currently in the U.S. But um, turning to, to the question then, you know, which, Victoria, I'm glad you brought it up, but we're getting some questions in the Q&A too here about Zoom bombing. So I wanted to ask Oren, um, just to follow up on, on when you were talking about that a minute ago, do you see this as coordinated um, by, you know, extremist groups or extremists, you were saying, you know, in lone wolf independent actors, is this just kind of like something to do while people are bored? Um, are there particular courses or individuals that you're seeing targeted? Um, what are kind of patterns are emerging? Yeah, so, so the answer is a little bit of all of the above. Um, you know, this did not really start as an extremist tactic. Um, you know, you had uh, kids or students who were sharing, you know, the Zoom links of the classes that they were taking because they're doing more online now and, you know, hoping that somebody would disrupt it. You know, I mean, I had to sort of downplay it, but it was almost like disrupt it in ways that you wouldn't feel normally comfortable doing because you're face to face with people. People tend to be a little bit more bold, right, behind the screen. And so that was sort of a natural sort of uh, conclusion. But what we saw was the disruption started taking different forms, even by non-extremists, where, you know, racial and religious epithets would be used or, you know, misogynistic, right? Like that sort of like base sort of commentary was part of the disruption. So you don't have to be a neo-Nazi, right, to use like, uh, 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 extremist language or bigoted language. But as is, you know, always happens, the extremists tend to catch up. And we have seen not just the extremist example I gave of a neo-Nazi hacker, but, you know, in online spaces that are, you know, commonly used by extremists. So these are telegram channels, you know, Gab, uh, some, you know, gaming platforms where extremists sort of come together and communicate. They were sharing, um, videos of people who recorded their Zoom bombing, the way that people record when somebody swats somebody, 
right? The, the kind of concept of you're playing a video game, you're all on the screen, somebody, you know, calls the cops and says, hey, so-and-so has guns or is doing something bad, and a SWAT team comes to your house. And there's been video upon video. Um, it's like there's doxing and swatting, et cetera. So the same thing is played out. And now you actually have extremists who are targeting um, specifically communities that they oppose. So these are Jewish institutions, LGBTQ communities, um, Muslim uh, events, right? All the sort of standard enemies that, for example, white supremacists view are now being systematically targeted in ways that we had not seen. So the extremists caught up. Now, the good news is there's really simple ways to sort of defend against this Zoom bombing. Because for the most part, it's not like hackers like secretly finding the passcode and getting in. It's people not realizing what the settings are. And I'm gonna share in our chat function right now, um, a piece that ADL put out that has like step-by-step, -step, here are ways that you can uh, you know, protect your next Zoom meeting. Um, and I think these are just sort of simple practical steps. Zoom has its own set that this is very similar to. And so extremists will always try to find a way to do this. Um, reporting is really important to law enforcement. You can report to ADL. Um, but again, I just want to say this is an extension of efforts by extremists to harass and express hatred against their enemies that goes well beyond before this pandemic started. This has been happening on every social media platform since social media platforms started. And this is the latest battle that we have. So the other issue that's been asked here is, you know, when this happens. So, for example, your classroom, you know, your your professor, you're teaching in class, and and the Zoom bombing happens. You know, maybe you lose control of it, whatever. But, you know, Cynthia, what do you think is like most important to do? You know, the next time you get your course together, you know, is is how how do you reconvene after something like that, and, and what's most important to discuss? So I think the most important thing is to not ignore it. And so one of the things that we know, even from when these incidents, kinds of incidents have happened on our own campuses, you know, in, um, in, in real life, like, um, you know, a swastika stamped in the snow or horrific, you know, racial epithets and incidents on campuses, is that when faculty do not raise it in their classes the next time they meet, like the, we know this happened on campus, the interpretation that students make, particularly students from vulnerable groups, is that that faculty member doesn't care. Um, what faculty members tend to think is, I, you know, I didn't raise it because I'm teaching physics or I didn't raise it because this doesn't relate to our topic in the class, right? So, um, but, but that's not the way that students read it. Students read silence as, um, as, as, you know, that, that the faculty member really doesn't care about this issue or it, it thinks it doesn't involve them or um, matter. And I think when it's even more personal, like in, a, in an individual class that you're in, it's that much more important that you take the time. And so, and I think that's in general across the board right now, my, my advice to faculty is, is I know everybody's worried about conveying content and getting, getting um, across, but I think what students actually most need is engagement and a, a chance to check in and understand. I mean, they're under incredible stress financially, emotionally, um, anxiety, their caregivers, some of them are sick, their family members are sick. And so on top of that, to have these kinds of hateful um, and extremist attacks happening in an intimate classroom setting is awful. The exact response probably will vary on the size of the class. If you're teaching a, a 500 person introduction, you know, introductory lecture, that's gonna be a really different kind of you know, response than if you're teaching a class, a seminar with 12 students where you can actually have a conversation and you know all the students already. And so I think each faculty member has to think about how they respond and, and um, but, but the, the worst thing you can do is ignore it. So I think paying attention to vulnerable students, reaching out to them individually, if you know who they are, students who might've been particularly affected by that. Um, and, uh, and then also just addressing it in the beginning and asserting what your own values are as a class and why that was not okay and, and that you're open for conversation um, if students want to follow up is it at least a place to start. Yeah, I think, I think that's uh, exactly about, about, right about um, not ignoring it and, and, and understanding that people experience these things differently and that they have been, um, you know, like microaggressions, there are groups in, of, in society, there are, there are certain identity markers that are targeted more often. Victoria, you were talking uh, at the beginning a little bit about some of those dynamics in the world of uh, just, just among PEN members, among others, the ways that we've seen 
uh, women targeted for online harassment more commonly, uh, black and brown women, LGBTQ identities. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about what your advice is, is to you know, people from those backgrounds about war, what more they can do, and, but also about allyship, how people can express solidarity. What do you think has, has worked to, to support people uh, when they're confronting these situations? I'm very glad that you, I think you and I have spent so much time talking together about this issue. Um, I'm really appreciative of how you asked that question because I think there is often, um, like when I first started doing this work, there's there's always, always sort of more and more pressure put on the people who are being targeted by abuse to figure out other ways to try to protect themselves and fight back and defend themselves. And I actually do think it's really important to empower people with as many resources and tools as possible to fight back, but there are much larger questions of institutional support and allyship and how colleagues can help each other. So. It's a little bit, John, the question is quite big because it depends a little bit if you're talking about in virtual classrooms or social media, right? Um, I might just address social media for now and if we want to talk about, because Cynthia did you know, a very good job talking about like virtual classrooms um, and or like what do you do in those spaces. So I'll talk a little bit about social media um, and then if folks have follow-up questions we can talk about um, classrooms some more. But I would say proactively the top two things someone who's on the receiving end of abuse can do is like really basic steps on cybersecurity. Um, and again, we can go into more detail. I can also, I'll send a link here. Um, I, I wrote an article for Slate on essentially how to dox yourself, but not literally, like how to do an audit of everything that's available about you online on social media that a bad actor could try to use against you or use to hurt you and figure out how to get as much of that stuff removed as possible and to kind of put more protective boundaries around yourself. That's one piece. The other piece is really, in advance, building a supportive cyber community that's gonna have your back. And I usually talk about it in two ways. So the, the first part of that cyber community is very small group of people who's your rapid response team, right? Those are people that you really know and trust. It's a very small group of people, maybe a very family member, a close friend, colleagues. You put those people on a WhatsApp group or in an email list server somewhere. And if you come under attack, especially if you're about to write something that you're concerned is going to be a, you know, a flashpoint, you go to those people and you say, look, my house, my home address got doxxed. Can I come stay with you for a few days? Can you help me do some blocking and muting on the platform? Because I literally can't take looking at this anymore, but I need someone to make sure I don't get threatened. You know, like that very kind of intimate kind of support is a core group of people. But then you have, I mean, in a way, the, one of the good things about the web is that you can have allies literally on the other end of the globe and i've seen this play out among journalists literally you know like from one country across another supporting one another and so letting your communities know what's happening to you tell them okay this is what's happening this is the kind of support i would really appreciate can go a long way so that you don't feel alone because there really is strength and safety in numbers but from the standpoint of, in a way, I think more importantly, even um, allyship, like how can people help you? Any one of us can report on social media. I have met people who are just like wonderful vigilante reporters on social media who will sit down for like 20 minutes and just like report kind of homophobic slurs and racist abuse that they see happening to their friends and their colleagues. Um, journalists particularly do this. Uh, I would say reporting is something that um, anyone can do trusted allies whom you'd be comfortable handing the keys over to your account can actually help you block and mute. Um, documenting anybody can do, tagging the platforms when they're not doing a good job removing content that's clearly a blatant violation of their terms of service can actually go a long way. Um, and honestly, just reaching out, like the whole point of, a, of almost any kind of abuse is to isolate the target and to intimidate them, right? And so, reaching out to someone privately on whatever channel you feel comfortable doing so and saying, look, I'm seeing this happen to you. I'm horrified. Here are three ways I can help you. Would any of these things be helpful? You know, I can help you report. I can make a public statement about this. You know, I can help you in X, Y, Z ways rather than kind of trying to do it before you've talked to someone, like just check in and see what else you can do and just say, look, maybe you just need to talk. Like maybe you need a listening ear because this stuff really is getting to you. Um, maybe you need me to talk to the chair of our department because you don't feel comfortable doing so or to back you up in a conversation with the chair of our department or whatever. So those are just some quick basic ideas. I have a lot more I could say, um, but the field manual again is a good place to go for really detailed um, kind of explanations of how allies can help one another and what they can do for one another. Um, thanks, thanks, Victoria. I think uh, you you covered a lot of ground there, and I want to just go back to um, what you were saying a minute ago about institutional supports and invite some comments either from Cynthia or in 
here, when we think about, you know, what universities can be doing, you know, beyond the individual faculty members, uh, there was a question earlier on about, you know, a trend we've seen on many campuses um, um, in, in the past few years. And I think actually, in some ways, I'll just pause for a minute there, but I think, you know, in some ways, the Zoom bombing experience and the virtual experience is bringing attention to online hate and harassment because it's allowing it to reach a, a greater number of people than in the situations which we're more familiar with, which are, you know, as, as we were saying, Victoria, you know, I'm the individual and I spoke out or, you know, uh, uh, people say maybe I deserved to be harassed for the, what I said or um, I was outspoken and now I'm, you know, getting what's coming to me. Um, so I think in general in higher ed, we've seen most universities treat these as situations that are kind of individuals and, and mit, whether they deserved it or not, it was kind of like largely on the individual or maybe on um, um, the, them and their, you know, uh, uh, peers who, who might have the time to help them out. But I'm just wondering from like an institutional perspective, um, what, what you all think, you know, department chairs or, um, you know, faculty, you know, peers or, or other deans or other institutional uh, actors can be doing in response to situations where professors are themselves uh, facing harassment? Well, I would say there are at least a couple of things. I mean, I think that all department chairs and deans should be actively engaged in um, trying to create anti-racist training for their faculty, um, both for regular classroom and also now increasingly in the online um, experience so that faculty are better equipped to respond, to recognize and respond to not just extreme, I mean, I'm an expert on extremism, but extremist content, but also um, uh, things that don't maybe rise to the level of, of, of white supremacist extremist, you know, terrorism or violent um, extremism, but that are um, racist trolling, misogynistic harassment, um, those kinds of things that, that faculty are equipped and know how to respond to those kinds of things. So being proactive, not just reactive. So trying to think constructively about what kinds of opportunities faculty need to get up to speed. I think, you know, We've only been doing this for about a month. Um, this massive shift online, and and I think the, you know, it's it's I've never experienced anything like it. The level of you know webinars and quick you know quick um, trainings that have been available for faculty to kind of pivot that quickly, and everyone I think has been understandably very focused on the technical details of this. Like, how do we change presentations? How do we handle online exams? How do we you know what do we do about you know. Um, I don't know, discussion groups like required internship hours, right? There's a lot of technical stuff that has, has had to be resolved. And so, but I think, you know, with the summer coming up, who knows what's going to happen with teaching continuing in the fall, whether we're still in this situation, I think we have to have some more proactive measures in place to prepare people better. We're leaning on experts and experts um, who really are um, you know, working with anti-racist education and anti-racist training, in addition to kind of recognizing the extremism, because as Oren was saying earlier too, there is this huge range, right? You have um, some who are some kids who are trying to shut down a platform so get it kicked off of um, iTunes so that they don't have homework, right? And then others who are trying to um, systematically attack individuals because of the group that they're a part of and, and the marginalized community they're a part of. So I think. Um, uh, being prepared for, as part of it. I think um, having um, as many resources available to, to faculty around, you know, the guidance on keeping your platform safe. What does it mean? I and mean, somebody asked a question in a chat that I don't know the answer to, but, you know, we need these kinds of answers. If you're using Canvas or you're using Blackboard or you're using one of these other Microsoft team platforms and you put the Zoom link in there, does that change the security? Does it not? What does it mean to have, you um, uh, to require legal names for students who may not want to use their legal names, right? Um, if, if that is uh, outing them in some way or creating, you know, creating other kinds of problems for vulnerable communities. So what are the ways that we can be sensitive to particular needs of particular groups and still protect everyone else? I think we need guidance on all of that. And I haven't seen yet a lot of proactive guidance coming out other than the really quick reactive emergency guidance, but I think that's also understandable. It's just, I think that's what we should be looking forward to in the next, you know, six to eight weeks, I hope. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And I think, I think you're, you're hitting on that kind of moment that a lot of higher education is in right now between, you know, shifting online and then what does that really mean? And I think we're, we're seeing with the Zoom bombing and with other things, just how um, tricky, you know, transferring in-person engagements into the online environment has been. I mean, we haven't 
talked about it here yet today, but also the huge equity concerns uh, are always, uh, you know, core, very close to my heart. And I've been thinking a lot about all the students who are not online or are struggling to be online or for whom, you know, academic success this semester really has been very much more deeply affected than for maybe other students as well. Um, you know, at Penn, we've we spent a good deal of time thinking about guidance for a lot of different scenarios. And um, my colleague is just going to post here in the chat a link to um, some of the uh, advice that we've developed on um, how universities and how uh, administrators can support faculty facing harassment or what faculty can themselves do um, if thinking about engaging on social media or if they encounter um, harassment. But I wanted to throw it, a question to you, Oren, you know, in thinking about, um, again, this kind of like, what is the role of, of, of the institution here? What is the role of the university? You know, if you were leading a university with everything that you know about extremism in the United States and all the ways that it is fomenting, you know, are there tips that you would want to make sure that your faculty are aware of? Are there things that you as a university leader might try and do and speak out against some of these challenges? You know, I mean, I don't want to sort of speak out of school, no pun intended. If I was the leader of a university, I would hire Cynthia and then say, whatever Cynthia says should happen. Um, but uh, I mean, I I'll put it this way, you know, seeing so much extremist activity on college campuses and also high schools, et cetera, we're often asked like, what, what is the role? And, you know, we sort of double down on the need to, like, don't just be a bystander, that university administrators, when something happens, need to, you know, speak out. Even if it's to say, you know, this is protected speech, but this does not meet our values, right? And so I think there's little things that will make students feel like they are heard, that, you know, usually it's like hate crimes, you might target one person, the whole community is impacted by that well beyond the individual. These things tend to spread. In fact, they're weaponized online. Um, and we've, we've dealt with this on many, many occasions that, you know, do an investigation, but then demonstrate leadership to the community. And maybe that sounds like super simple, but in a time where leadership doesn't always speak out in this country, just more broadly, I think it's fair to sort of double down on the need um, for the voices of leadership to make those who are targeted feel like they're heard and that they're protected. And I think there's a lot more that can be done on university. So again, whether I was leading university or not, um, educating about what is the extremist activity that's happening, what is the potential, and to encourage people to use their voice because that's the type of comfort that is required. You have to admit that you have a problem before you can deal with it. And one, one last sort of uh, uh, is issue adjacent to what you were just mentioning, is you know, providing tools, uh, back to Cynthia's point, is critical. And I think these things are kind of new, but there's also like tried and true types of tools that could be recirculated. And one of the things that I've been dealing a lot with the last couple of days from universities, but also community groups is we were targeted by a Zoom bomb and we all sat there and we didn't know what to do. Literally, when you are victimized by hate, Sometimes it like takes a minute for you to orient yourself, be like, what is actually happening right now? And what people, what I've heard over and over again is, what are the tips that I need to, what is it that I need to do in order to save that? So should I hit record? Like we are, pu we are putting together a list of sort of practical tips, knowing that sometimes you're not gonna, your instinct isn't gonna be right there, but things to consider when you are being harassed online so that when it's over or you're able to mitigate it, there are steps that can be taken, maybe legal, maybe with law enforcement, to bring those people to justice. And we need to have those tools about how to even just, you know, um, document the instances when they occur. And so we, we hope to be able to provide that as well. I, um, there's just a bunch of questions about uh, the recording. So I wanted to make clear that yes, um, for those who've asked, uh, we are gonna be able to share the slides from today's presentation, we will also be uh, how, housing um, the recording of the session uh, on, a, on our Penn website. We also, um, if you're looking for more resources on all these issues, um, we've posted some things in the chat group here uh, from ADL as well as uh, from Penn. And um, on the Penn side, we do have uh, some resources that we've developed in the campus speech program specifically for college students on these issues as well. So I think um, it's important, you know, when I reflect on these issues too, for faculty to be thinking not just about um, you know, their own safety, their own role, and their own voice, but the voice of their students and how they can 
uh, be a role model and how they can um, support students or, or provide them with information as well. I wanted to ask, um, Victoria, I know you often talk about the, this, the precise thing Warren was just mentioning, you know, about documenting what's happening to you. Do you have any tips from all of your experience working with journalists that might be relevant for professors who are themselves encountering some situation yeah. like this? I can't emphasize enough how important documentation is. Um, you know, it, if it's on social media, screenshots are good, they really help, take one of those, but also make sure you save the direct link to the abuse um, for several reasons. One, if you report it and you succeed in getting it taken down, it's like the abuse evaporates. And so having a screenshot um, and just some basic information uh, about what happened to you is really important. Also, I have found in my experience talking to people who've experienced a lot of abuse that it can be incredibly difficult to have conversations verbally with a colleague, with your boss, um, about what is happening to you. And sometimes a screenshot is so much more effective to get your point across than trying to paraphrase horrible things you just don't even want to say out loud. And it's true with law enforcement too. And when you, when you try to engage law enforcement on this issue, not all um, law enforcement is equally well trained in dealing with online abuse or recognizing that it's real and it's a problem and it has damaging effects. And so if you can actually go with a bunch of printed stuff and say, look at this is what I'm experiencing. People are threatening my children. You know, that actually goes a long way. And it, it, if at any point you decide to actually um, engage legal counsel, they need to be able to establish a course of conduct over a period of time. It can't be a one-off thing. And so if you've taken, if you've documented it over a period of time, and you can, I mean, Zoom bombing in a way, it's almost easier because many of us, you know, we were recording our webinar, so you, you've, you've essentially documented it, um, but it's really important to keep it because if you then go to report to law enforcement or to the FBI or whatever else, um, you need that evidence. So I'm glad, I'm really glad you brought that up. And, and I emphasize too, like report on platforms. They're not always equally good at responding, but it's really, really important to report. They are getting better at it. And again, it creates like a trail of what, what's happening and enables research on this issue, so. Yeah, it's not the uh, focus of today's session, but I will just echo that, you know, from my own experience and, you know, before I think uh, I was recently counting, before the pandemic hit, I was traveling zipping, I think you were too, Victoria, around the country um, to so many different states talking about these issues on, on a lot of campuses. And I can tell you that there are vast inconsistencies in the ways in which police or campus police uh, or others um, view almost, I mean, not the same fact pattern always, but similar ones enough where you say, well, you know, would these people in this other part of the country have looked at that, um, you know, that, that, that screenshot and said, yeah, that was a threat versus somebody who said it was not. And so I, I'm, I'm struck sometimes by not just the inconsistencies uh, in how that's interpreted and applied, but also, frankly, just the inequities in who has access to um, lawyers or other, you know, who has through their personal networks, people who can advise them of situations where, you know, indeed, this does rise to a level of hate and harassment um, that crosses a line or that is beyond the pale and that you should have some recourse, you should, you know, be, be this should be taken seriously by um, administrators in your university and, and and sometimes um, it is difficult to figure out just how best to connect the people on the receiving ends of those situations, as you were talking about, like the victims who are, you know, often in the midst of trying to sort out how they should respond to the resources or the individuals who could um, uh, best support them. Um, I see you nodding, Cynthia, so I'm just wondering if you had anything you wanted to add on this. Yeah, I, I was just going to add a couple things. Um, I agree with uh, everything that the folks have said. I think it's also important for faculty who are already tenured or tenure track at least and, and for senior administrators to remember that um, sometimes junior faculty and contingent faculty or adjunct faculty feel much more vulnerable about reporting these kinds of things. They worry about being a squeaky wheel. They think um, or they don't know about the resources that might be there on campus. And so I think being clear about um, any university leader should, should make it a priority to clarify to faculty who they can go to, what are the reporting chains, who's the investigator on campus. There should be a designated investigator on campus who will respond and in investigate claims and get back to people to let them know, like, we have looked into this and and um, this is what we think, or thank you, or, or continue to keep a file open for, particularly for faculty who are repeatedly um, harassed and, and having problems. And so that is, I think, an obligation of the university and communicating that to faculty is important, but remember that not all faculty will feel um, um, empowered 
to, to take those resources in the same way. And so um, the more that, that, that leaders can be clear about how to, how to include faculty and how to encourage faculty to take advantage of those reporting chains, I think, once they exist, and assuming they do exist, um, can't just assume that everyone will access those resources in the same way or feel as comfortable going to public safety um, because of the histories of, of public safety's engagement with communities of color, let's say. Um, so, you know, not everybody will make use of the resources in the same way. And so finding a way to create those pathways for people to report and feel safe and know who they can go to for resources is important. We have about 10 more minutes uh, and uh, just wanted to invite if anybody uh, has any other questions to please put them in the Q&A. But I, I want to just shift for a second to, to, to return to something we've touched on a few times here around students then. Um, so one thing is, you know, we can, faculty can um, be better uh, prepared for situations where, you know, they might want to be better preparing their personal identity or uh, preparation against docs. We've talked about ways in which university leaders and others can be um, um, offering support or, or Victoria, you were talking about like allyship before, but I'm thinking about just, just wanting to ask, you know, what do you think we really need to be watching out for with, with going back to what you were talking about before, Cynthia, with so many students online and with, with, you know, how, how you think about, you know, onlineification and uh, the, it's just general impacts on hate and harassment. Um, those of us, you know, faculty who are in touch with students on, you know, either a weekly basis or, or something, you know, more common, you know, what, what are kind of telltale signs? What should we be watching out for? Oh, these are hard questions. Um, I mean, I think, I think you have to look at a range of what to watch out for. I mean, I think with, um, with young people across the board, so I would include the K-12 system here, I think, you know, we are going to see a range of emotional responses the same way that we're seeing a range of emotional responses among adults. And I don't think we can expect people, even ourselves or anyone else, to feel the same way about the situation today as we did yesterday, as we will tomorrow. And so understanding that there is emotional volatility, that there are emotional vulnerabilities to, um, to, to radicalization in the case of the things that I study, but also um, that, that having those kinds of online doxing or harassment or Zoom bombing is going to make this situation worse, that, that we have um, a perfect storm where young people are going to be encountering this content, where everyone's going to be encountering this content more and more often, but young people in particular are going to be in spaces like online gaming chat rooms or places where we know recruiters for extremist groups are, are you know, are active and engaged. And so just being really aware of, of those vulnerabilities, of how people are feeling, that they're feeling um, disenchanted, afraid, anxious, depressed, um, fearful for the future, worried about their economic outlooks for themselves and their family, worried about their health for themselves and their family and their loved ones. And all of those kinds of insecurities um, create a situation where someone can come along and say, hey, a stronger state, a more, you know, a, a, a better regime um, or a better solution um, retreat to the Northwest Territory, you know, whatever, whatever that solution is that, that, that groups support to offer starts looking a little bit more appealing. Um, we see this also with conspiracy theories, and I think that's something to be aware of too, to be looking out for language that suggests there's an orchestrated effort here that is behind the virus or that is responsible for the virus. Um, we've already seen a couple of, you know, violent attacks, one foiled and the other um, a train derailed you know, related to conspiracy attacks, um, trying to attack hospitals, I suspect those are gonna go up. I think, you know, understanding that there, that the immediate crisis is important, but that the repercussions of this for how people are going to respond is gonna be an echo that we're gonna feel for some months to come. And so keeping our awareness up about this um, is a first step. And then, and the only other thing I'll say, I think is that, and John, you know this example, because we've talked about this at length, but when we think about responding, um, you know, the early responses that university and university leaders made to the onslaught of white supremacist paper flyers and propaganda very much hung on like a lot of technical kinds of violations. Like, um, I won't name the university, but probably the most famous one is like white supremacist flyers were found and they were removed because, you know, there's, there's, they're not allowed to use adhesive on campus buildings, right? And so, 
that was a mistake. And I think most university leaders widely recognize that reacting to it by pointing to the technical violations of policy was a mistake, that it's really important to um, be very clear about what we stand for as a community, what we stand for as a classroom, what we stand for as a school, as a college, as a faculty, um, and why these kinds of violations, whether it's through Zoom bombing or harassment or attacks or whatever people are experiencing, go against everything we stand for um, as a community. And those kinds of reassurances for everyone else go a long way in establishing what the community stands for in ways that I think make people feel safer and included and more protected um, in with whatever they then encounter online. Yeah, I couldn't, um, I can't echo a lot of that enough. I think uh, it, it, we try to, uh, in our work at Penn, really um, um, take some of that advice and boil it down into uh, some of the kind of like step-by-step, -step, what can you do when you're facing different situations? And we often talk about, uh, as you know, you know, the importance of speaking out and speaking often and the university using its own voice to speak to it, its values. Um, I just, there was a question here, Oren, and I'm, I'm curious if you've seen any examples. I know there's a, there's a concern that has been voiced online that um, with people using more Zoom, with, with classrooms going more virtual, there could be kind of more opportunities for bullying, for harassment, for kind of screenshots, you know, by students as bad actors. Um, so I was just, you know, there was a question here, if you've seen any examples of that with the intention to um, uh, uh, intimidate uh, or, 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 you know, with other kind of hateful intent behind it. And then just generally, I wanted to ask if you had any other thoughts uh, uh, in closing on, you know, what we need to watch out for, for our students. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like most of what's certainly reported to ADL, most of what we're reading about is with the intent to harass uh, and disrupt. So I would say most of the Zoom bombing that we're seeing, knowing that some of it is, you know, uh, sophomoric behavior or, you know, offensive behavior, putting pornographic images during class. I mean, a lot of it is actually employing, you know, hate and it's targeted toward the um, meetings themselves based on the person perceived, you know, religious, religion, race, et cetera. So it's hate for hate's sake um, in many, in many occasions. And we've discussed like some of the, the steps, you know, in closing, I just want to say like, you know, we should all be motivational speakers or something. I mean, this is depressing stuff, but we need to, we need to remember like, and, and I can't stress this enough. And I feel like I say this all the time, but these are opportunities that we have now too, to, you know, the tech industry as a whole beyond just Zoom has an opportunity to take the harassment and hate on their platforms more seriously now. More people are engaged, maybe spending more time if that's even possible. And we're gonna be looking to see how Zoom, how all these tech companies are gonna respond. So now there's an opportunity to do it better. There's an opportunity for people maybe who have more time on their hands to, you know, try to force uh, some change and corporate responsibility there. Um, I think there's opportunities for professors and for students who are dealing with online hate and harassment to use their voice to speak out, right? We, we can't just see it as we're all victimized and, and it's bad. Uh, we need to see this as opportunities to change it, to change the narrative, to hold people accountable. And so that's what keeps me hopeful in doing this work is that, yes, there are going to be bad actors there all the time, but I'm encouraged by being on a call with you know, the three of you and having 150 people show up who care to, to make a difference. So I just want to leave with a little bit of hope uh, from all of this. I appreciate that. Um, Victoria, uh, final comments from you, what things to watch out for. And, and there's a question in the Q&A about thinking about the, uh, you know, how we can better help college faculty understand the psychosocial impact for their students. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I think I'll, I, I do really, I really like the note that Oren was, <laughs> was bringing us to. So let those be effectively the closing remarks, but to answer your question about psychosocial impact, um, I can't stress enough how damaging um, online abuse can be on emotional and psychological health for people. Um, I think we are finally at a point where we understand that online is real life, like these are, these are completely artificial mythical boundaries uh, and being threatened um, and attacked through your screen is not that different from having someone do it in a voicemail or even uh, you know, verbally attacked in person. So I think that the top, I guess, guidance I would have is um, 
push back against the intention to isolate you and to separate you from other people and to separate other people from you. So if you are um, like a convener, you are the person in the position of a faculty member uh, or a teacher, um, proactively reach out to people after an incident of abuse, whether it's individual or to the group, and just say, look, I know this happened. It's really, really destructive. I'm sorry that it happened. Let's talk about it. You know, reach out to me if you need to talk. We can have a conversation as a group. Um, and then I think from the individual standpoint, like self-care is really, really important, you know, finding time to unplug uh, and to connect with people that you care about deeply and that you value and trust in your life is really important, you know, ideally with their faces or their voices involved. Um, and seeking psychological support um, if you need it. You know, I, I, tell, I tell journalists this all the time, you know, don't underestimate how much impact this can have on you and talk to your colleagues, talk to the people you trust and care about and talk to a professional if you need the support and the help. There's no shame in that. So um, I guess that's my, <laughs> to answer your question, maybe that's not closing remarks, but that's an answer to your question. Maybe I'll leave you, John, to give the closing well, remarks. Well, no, I, I think, I think uh, you know, it's a somber topic and I appreciate um, the seriousness with which you've all spoken with me about it today. And, and uh, I wanna thank all the people out there who've uh, uh, tuned in for this uh, first webinar in uh, what will be a series for us at PEN America. Um, if you're interested in this work, uh, please feel free to follow us on social media or you can look up our uh, contact uh, online. Uh, if you're interested in advice, please, uh, you know, we always encourage people to reach out and to uh, consult our uh, two online guides. Victoria uh, the, mentioned the guide on online harassment and uh, I mentioned the guide that we have more specifically on um, campus free speech issues. Our next webinar in the series uh, next week will be continuing with actually some of the things that you were talking about Oren a minute ago to how we take advantage of this opportunity and how we kind of galvanize to do things better. We'll be talking next week about um, hate and bias related incidents um, uh, related to the spread of COVID-19, particularly targeting the Asian American community and the ways in which higher education leaders can respond um, um, and express solidarity. So that'll be our topic next week. Please join us. It'll be next uh, Wednesday, April 15th at uh, 3.30 p.m. And in closing, just a final thank you to Oren Cynthia and Victoria, you can't hear the applause, I know, but it, it's out there. Uh, thank you all very much.